Hello, it's Gary Fox here, and tonight we're going to talk about a statement I made when I talked about Fourier series. I said that it was a sum of sinusoid waves of even multiples of the uh, fundamental frequency. Later on I said that it was uh, both sines and cosines. So I need to talk a little bit about why you look at both sines and cosines. Okay, right now I show a picture of a sine wave and a cosine wave. And the sine wave's in red, the cosine wave's in blue. And then what I've done is I've added those two together to come up with the sum wave, sum of the two, which is also a sinusoid. Okay, let's look at this. Time is on the uh, the x-axis down here. So this is later in time at 0 0.5 and at 1 second we've completed a complete cycle. So things that are to the right are actually later than things that are to the left. And that's a little bit backwards of what you'd think, but that's just the way it works. So, that is, as you look to the right, things are happening later in time. Okay, you can see that the sine wave is at peak at zero seconds, and the cosine wave is at zero. And then the cosine wave gets at a peak at a, about 0.25 seconds. And, uh, and then... So in other words, the cosine wave is lagging behind the sine wave. Okay, when we add the two together, depending upon the strength of the sine wave and the cosine wave, we will end up with a delay in the sum, which is what we're really interested in is the sum, but the easiest way to express it is finding both the sine wave and the cosine wave. So let's look at a uh, case of just a zero shift. There's zero cosine wave, and there is a 100% sine wave. And as you notice at this one here, and I'll have to uh, I'll have to turn some things off here. Okay, the cosine wave. If I turn it off. Nothing happens. It was the line that was going right across zero because we don't have any cosine wave on this one. We have no strength on that one. But now if I go to the sine wave and I turn it off, you see that the sine wave is all there is. And so therefore the sum, sum wave is exactly the same amplitude and phase as the uh, sine wave. And that's what we're changing is the phase. Okay, I've got a whole bunch of them here that I'll show you. Okay, if the uh, sine wave is decreased by a little bit, but the cosine wave is increased, we're starting to get a shift. In this case, it's a 30 degree shift. It's happening 30 degrees later than what the sine wave by itself would be. Okay, if they're both the same strength, then we get a shift of 45 degrees. And then if the uh, cosine wave is getting stronger and the sine wave is decreased, we get even more shift. In this case, it's uh, 60 degrees lagging. And then if the uh, sine wave is turned off and the cosine wave is full strength, we're getting a 90 degree shift. 90 degrees lagging from what the uh, sine wave would be. So that's basically why we have to look at both the sine wave and the cosine wave. Okay, if you think about harmonics, think back to what we did when we were dealing with filters, and I'll try to put a link uh, in the uh, put a link in the video notes that will take you to my web page, and in my web page I'll link back to some of the older posts that were all just in writing where we actually did some uh, filters. 
And as you think about those filters, the uh, not only does the amplitude decrease, but also it causes a phase shift. So that means that the higher frequencies won't be in exactly the same phase as what the uh, low frequency was. So now all of a sudden we have to deal with a phase shift, and by doing looking at both the sine wave and the cosine wave, we're able to look at that phase shift. This is kind of complicated, but I don't know any other way of talking about it. Now, why does it do that phase shift? Well, as we look at things a little different way, let's uh, save this. And we'll look at it in a little different kind of way of looking at this thing. Okay, right now, I am looking at, and I'm not sure, okay, that one's all hid. That's the reason. Okay, I'm looking at a uh, 30 degree phase shift right now. And as you can see, my sine wave, if I plot it in the way it is in relationship to the cosine wave, sine, sine is at 90 degrees, cosine is at 0 degrees. And since I have a smaller, a smaller uh, amount of cosine, I only pull it back by 30, which makes it at 60 degrees. If I do a 45 degree angle, so we'll hide this one, and now we'll go up here and do the 45, we'll turn it on. You see I have both the sine and the cosine at exactly the same amount of amplitude, and so we pull it by 45 degrees. We're causing it to lag in relationship to the sine wave by 45 degrees. And uh, that, the reason I did it, plot it this way, this is another way of looking at things, and we're right back at our orthogonal situation where we have a right angle here. We have the two components, so what happens to the sine wave does not have any effect at all on the cosine wave, and I pointed to the wrong ones. The sine wave has no effect on the cosine wave, and so when you add the two together, you're able to pull it. Just like we did with uh, braces when we were dealing with statics way back here when I was doing the, uh, the crane. So the same things happen over and over and over again. It's just you have to look at things a little different. This right in here is basically a phaser plot. And normally you would draw the sine wave, you would use the cosine wave as your uh, reference. But I decided to use sine wave because sine is the uh, one that most people think of. Anyhow, this is exactly the same thing when we were doing phaser plots. We were plotting with an imaginary number. Here I'm calling it a sine. And so it's a way of dealing with the... Uh, shifting. Okay, whole point of this, whole point, because I really don't care if you, you memorize all this, because I had problems creating these graphs and uh, explaining it. And excuse this cat, I just saved a uh, cat that was out in the middle of the road, it was a little kitten, and uh, I am now the proud owner of another cat. That's what I get for saving a critter, I guess. Anyhow, the whole point that I want to prove is that by looking at both the sine and the cosine, you're able to determine the phase shift of the actual wave that is created. And that's what we will be doing in the future as we start deconstructing waveforms and finding out what the frequency components are. Uh, this was kind of complicated one. I hopefully you got something out of it. Let me save this. We'll go back to the uh, previous one. And this plot right here, this kind of shows it. How as the sine and the cosine changes strength in relationship to each other, it causes the, uh, the sum of the two to basically, it's the same frequency, but it's changing in phase with 
reference to the uh, sine wave. And, by the way, these can get completely so, so weak that then they start going negative so they're out of phase. And that really starts to change things back in the opposite direction. So the magic numbers tell you more than what, what, uh, what you would know otherwise. And basically the math is a kind of a game to get the job done. Uh, and as we deconstruct, we'll be talking a little bit more about this. Uh, but that's what happens. The uh, next video, I guarantee, is going to be a whole lot more fun. This one was complicated. Appreciate you wit listening and watching. Uh, hopefully you got something out of this. Uh, and feel free to email me if you're having problems trying to understand what I was really doing here. Thank you. This is Gary Fox of Create Me.